Yeah. Maybe that's not plugged in fully. is a long time for a family death, even a close uh, family member. I was in the ICU and went down there and okay. dying over the weekend. And then I made it back Tuesday. I had to go back down. We didn't have class Wednesday, so I just missed the week of class. If you can demonstrate that to me, then I'll let you do the uh, bonus handout that we gave on Monday. So if you've got a copy of the, there was, I'm assuming there was a service. Yeah. Down in Portland, but I get some from my parents. Yeah, you'll need to get a copy of that to demonstrate that you were there. Okay. <clears throat> okay, go ahead and turn in that extra credit assignment. I'll pick that up. You're late, you don't get to turn one in. Copy each other's answers. Come on, hand them in now. Now or never. Hey, let's talk about waiting to the last minute. Just in time. Okay, I'll take yours too. <laughs> okay, um, this is back a few slides from when I stopped uh, in the last session um, looking at uh, sex determination in humans and asking the question, how do we know that it's a Y chromosome that determines maleness? Um, and the reason we know that is because of some of these sex chromosome abnormalities. And actually, um, over the course of the rest of the week, I'm going to talk about some others that don't necessarily involve entire, the entire X and Y, but only pieces of the X and Y, which sort of nails it down a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so the, the most common of these sex chromosome abnormalities was the Kleinfelter syndrome, the Turner syndrome, and the um, super male and, and super female syndromes. And as I had noted, the Kleinfelter syndrome is quite a bit more common than the book suggests. It's about 1 in 500 to 1 in 700 males rather than uh, 1 in 2,000 is indicated there. But Turner syndrome is uh, a much rarer syndrome because female embryos with Turner syndrome usually don't make it to, uh, to birth they have a tendency to fill up with fluid. They, they take on fluid, it's called edema, and they tend to die before they can be born. Some of these others are, are reasonably common and they don't cause any um, abnormalities, uh, obvious abnormalities. This, however, is Kleinfelter syndrome. Um, the individuals are XXY or sometimes higher levels of X's and Y's. Sometimes you see two X's and two Y's or three X's and a Y. Um, in all of those cases, the individuals are very clearly determined to be males. They have all the male uh, external genitalia. They have the male-specific plumbing. They have testes, but the testes are usually undescended, and so they're non-functional. They're usually, these individuals are usually sterile. But the differentiation process is all female. They develop at puberty, they develop breasts, female-specific um, 
uh, hair patterns, female specific fat deposition, body shape, that sort of thing is all, it's all those secondary female characteristics that happen at puberty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> they're, as I said, they're usually sterile and there are higher levels that exist. I mean, we see individuals with four X's and a Y chromosome. They're more highly feminized, but they still have male genitals okay, and male testes. So um, they are uh, clearly genetically male. Right. Um, the flip side of that is if you lack an X chromosome, then you're XO. Uh, that's Turner's syndrome. Uh, most, most of the time these embryos don't survive to birth, but if they do, they have a number of um, abnormalities. They have uh, degenerate ovaries. Interestingly, you can, you can have the same thing in mice. You can have XO mice, and those mice are fertile for a short period of time, but then their ovaries degenerate. So probably the reason why human Turner syndrome females are sterile is because it's uh, the long period of time between birth and actual reproductive maturity. Right, which can take um, normally um, at least 10 years and usually 11 or 12. Um, they also have some other external characteristics. They tend to have a sort of uh, rounded, swollen face, um, the webbing of skin around the neck, uh, an aortic constriction which um, causes heart um, problems and malformations. They don't develop the secondary sexual characteristics that you expect of females. Um, they, are, they are sterile because of those underdeveloped ovaries. What they don't show on this figure is they tend to have uh, joint malformations. The elbows particularly are affected by this. And they tend to have um, mental retardation. But as I said last, uh, last time I looked at this, they um, they can have completely normal intelligence. Um, there's a whole range of, um, of intelligence, much as with the general population. But there's a tendency toward lower IQs. Okay, um, there are such things as super females and super males. Um, super females have three X's or more X's. We see individuals with four X's or even five X's who are essentially completely normal. Okay. Um, they tend to have menstrual irregularities. The more X's a female has, the more problems they typically have with menstrual irregularities. But um, it's usually fairly minor. Triple, uh, triple X females, though, would tend to um, produce offspring with a high degree of sex chromosome abnormalities because those three X's are not going to pair in meiosis. You get two X's pairing up and one of them's left by itself. So you end up getting gametes with two X chromosomes. If those are fertilized by a Y-bearing sperm, there's a Kleinfelter's male. It's XXY. Okay. Um, there are super males, XYY. They tend to be taller than normal. Um, it was thought at one time that they were more aggressive than normal. It turns out that's not the case. They're perfectly normal. <laughs> um, the reason it was thought that they were more aggressive was that a high proportion of the male prison population was XXY. So people uh, made the incorrect inference that that extra Y was causing a greater degree of aggression. But it turns out the majority of XYY individuals are not in prison for violent crimes. So you, know, you can't say that it's, a, it's causing more aggression. All right, so what does this tell us? In all of these cases, if you have a Y chromosome, if you're a Kleinfelters, you still have male genitals, you have, you have a male sex determination scheme. However, if you don't have that Y chromosome, you have a female sex determination scheme. Right? You have ovaries. <coughs> you develop female genitalia. So, um, so you're female. Right? So what that means is the Y determines maleness in most mammals, including humans. All right, so um, that brings us up to where to some new stuff that we need to talk about, and that is uh, X and Y linkage. Books refer to this as sex linkage, and I hate that term because um, sex linkage includes both of the sex chromosomes, X and Y, when, when what they're really talking about is uh, X linkage, right? genes that are present on the X chromosome. How are those inherited? They have sort of an interesting inheritance pattern. Right? So there's a lot of genes on the X chromosome. 
It's pretty indispensable. You can't live without an X chromosome. Um, we do occasionally see embryos that are produced that lack an X, but they die very early. And so there's essential stuff on the X chromosome. There's not a lot of essential stuff on the Y chromosome. Obviously, you can get by without a Y. <coughs> it's a lot smaller as well. But the inheritance pattern is pretty unique. Um, if it's a recessive trait, males are affected a lot more often than females are. Okay? Um, if it's dominant, however, females are twice as likely to be affected than males. Um, I have some pedigrees that we're going to go through today that will help you see how that works. Um, and I'm going to give you some rules for looking at pedigrees so you can analyze them and know what kind of inheritance pattern is going on because you'll have to do that on the exam. All right, so if it's recessive, males are affected far more often than females. The reason is because a female has to inherit two copies of the recessive allele to be affected. A male only has to inherit one because he's only got one X. Okay? So it's much easier for a male to inherit those recessive traits. Um, okay, an example that the book talks about, the white eye trait in fruit flies. This was the first uh, mutation uh, or alteration from the wild type that was discovered in Drosophila. It was discovered in, uh, I want to say, 1910 by Thomas Hunt Morgan. Fruit flies have essentially an XXXY system. It's a little more complicated than that, but for our purposes, we can just consider it XXXY, just like us. All right, um, inheritance patterns. Look at these uh, crosses very carefully. What they're showing is the X chromosomes that are carried, and they're showing a big R or a little r to indicate the red eye allele or the recessive white eye allele. Now, if you take a female who's homozygous for the red eye allele, and so she has red eyes, you cross it with a male that has only um, the little r allele and therefore has white eyes, you end up getting two kinds of offspring, males and females. The females are all heterozygous because they inherit one of these big r alleles from their mother, and they inherit the little r from their father. So they're all heterozygous. The males inherit the y from their father. So the only X that they get is from their mothers, and so they inherit the big R allele, and so they have red eyes. Okay. Um, if, however, we take those heterozygous females and cross them to um, homozygous red-eyed males, then we end up producing some interesting results. We get two kinds of females. Phenotypically, they're the same. Right? They all have red eyes, but half of them are heterozygous and half of them are homozygous. With the males, we also get two kinds of offspring. Half of the males carry the dominant allele and half carry the recessive. Okay. <clears throat> if we take these heterozygous females and we cross them to white-eyed males, then half the females and half the males end up having white eyes. Okay. But the normal situation that you'd see is this sort of condition where you have heterozygous females cross with normal males and they produce affected offspring. This is the same thing that happens with human X-linked traits. That's why with recessive traits, males are far more likely to show the trait than females are. because It's just easier for the males to inherit one of those recessive alleles that will actually show up. Okay? So heterozygous females produce only affected sons. But they can produce affected daughters if they're mated to a white-eyed male. All right, so some human examples. There's a lot of traits um, in humans that are X-linked. Um, some really bizarre traits as well as some more familiar ones. Red-green colorblindness. Males are much more likely to be colorblind than females. The reason is because red-green colorblindness and inability to distinguish reds and greens from each other is um, X-linked. Okay? So uh, it's much more likely for males to, to not have that uh, ability. There are other forms of colorblindness, too. Some of them are not X-linked, but many of them are. And so males tend to have um, colorblindness more often than females. Some forms of hemophilia. Hemophilia is the inability to clot blood. And there's a number of different causes for it, but at least two of those causes 
are linked to the X chromosome. Um, hemophilia is, is deadly because a simple cut, you can bleed to death from it because you simply can't clot your blood. Um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is X-linked. Um, there's a number of muscular dystrophies that have many different causes, but one of them, one fairly common one, is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it's a, a rapid or a progressive atrophy of the muscles in an individual so that they get to the point where they can't move their limbs simply because they don't have muscles to do so. Um, so that disease is X-linked. Uh, there's a lot of others. There's a, a really funny disease called anhydrotic ectodermal dysplasia that's X-linked. Um, funny name, but basically what it means is you don't produce any glands in your skin. Okay, so sweat glands, um, oil glands, all those kinds of glands, you don't produce them. Um, it's deadly. The reason is because you can't sweat. And so even minimal physical exercise will kill you because you overheat. Um, kids that have this, what they do is they'll, they have these um, chilled vests that they make them wear that keeps their, um, their organs cool so that they're able to function out in the real world. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to. Okay. Another um, effect of that disease is you don't develop teeth. So teeth uh, apparently develop in the same way that skin glands do. Okay. It's sort of interesting. All right, this pedigree is a classic example of hemophilia. This is the one that the books all use. All right, this is the royal family of England from, uh, from George III through to uh, Victoria in that third generation where hemophilia was apparently first present. Okay, so Victoria was a carrier of hemophilia and she had a number of children. Um, notice this, this is funny. Um, Albert and Victoria, uh, Albert was uh, Victoria's husband. They were first cousins. Okay, notice that? <coughs> Interestingly. Um, that, you know, that, that's pretty typical of royal families though. You look at the, the royal families, the Habsburg family in, uh, in Austria and Spain, man, they controlled most of continental Europe. But they did it by inbreeding within their own family. They kept everything within their family, kept all the power in their family, and they got more and more inbred. And actually what, you'll, what you can see is in paintings of Habsburg rulers, you can see the effect of this. There's this classic thing called the Habsburg jaw. It's sort of an, a ju uh, jaw that juts out. And there are individuals in the Habsburg family who had such a strong Habsburg jaw that they couldn't chew their own food. Um, they drooled because they couldn't swallow. And it, was, it was nasty. That's why the Habsburg line died, because they inbred themselves to death. It's why there were so many dynasties in ancient Egypt, because they routinely, closely interbred. Brothers with sisters, mothers with sons, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, it's a very bad thing to do. You may not know this, but in, in uh, Tutankhamun's tomb, there were two very small sarcophagi that were found, and they were apparently uh, Tutankhamun's daughters. Both of them were female. They were uh, mummified stillbirths. And uh, apparently Tutankhamun's bride was also his sister. And so they were unable to produce viable offspring because they were so closely genetically related, interestingly. All right, so, um, so you know, examples of those kinds of genetic relative matings in royal families are pretty common. Um, they don't show it down here, but um, Elizabeth and Prince Philip, well, you can, you can see that they are also um, related to each other indirectly. They're like second cousins. All right, so Victoria was a carrier of hemophilia. She transmitted that to a number of offspring. Alice of Hess, her daughter, was a carrier. Um, her son, Leopold, Duke of Albany, he had hemophilia. Uh, her daughter, Beatrice, had hemophilia. And look at this. What she did to cement diplomatic relationships is marry her children off to um, continental uh, rulers all over the European continent. Okay, so we end up getting um, uh, hemophilia in the Prussian rulers. We get hemophilia in the Russian rulers. Um, uh, 
uh, Tsarina, uh, Alex Tsarina was the uh, wife of Nicholas II. They produced, as you know probably, four daughters and a son. Um, the youngest daughter was Anastasia, and it, it, it has been determined that she was in fact killed with the rest of them in the 1919 revolution. Um, but Alexis was the um, presumed heir to the, the uh, throne of Russia, and he had hemophilia because his mother was a carrier. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of examples of individuals. Here's Alfonso of Spain. Blam, he's got hemophilia. Gonzalo of Spain, hemophilia. Um, but look at this chart. If you look carefully, you see that the number of affected males, right, vastly outnumbers the number of affected females. In fact, there aren't any affected females in this um, pedigree. They're all carriers. Right? All these individuals, these females that have dots in those symbols, those are all carriers. Right? There's no affected females in here at all. They're all affected males. That's a classic case for X-linked recessive determination. Males vastly, affected males vastly outnumber affected females in a particular pedigree. Okay. Um, here's our current uh, royal family of England, Elizabeth II, uh, Prince Philip Mountbatten, and they produced four children, Charles, Anne, Andrew, and Edward. Um, and then, of course, Charles and Diana produced two offspring, William and Harry, who are uh, hemophilia-free. This whole line doesn't have to worry about it because it hasn't come down to them from Victoria. They're clear of the trait. <coughs> All right, so I asked this question. Why is it that many between close genetic relatives produce high percentages of genetic abnormalities? It's because those individuals are genetically related, so it's much more likely that they carry recessive alleles in common. Okay. <clears throat> so that's probably why in a lot of societies, uh, relationships between genetic relatives are forbidden, because they produce those kinds of abnormalities. Um, Look at the, the Amish populations. Um, they're so inbred that there's a lot of funny little recessive traits that are coming out. And they've become a, a case study for population geneticists studying um, obscure and odd human um, genetic abnormalities. <coughs> OK, um, what I want to do now is show you how to better analyze pedigrees. It doesn't matter. I, I'm going to use the overhead, so it doesn't matter. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to use the overhead. <coughs> to illustrate some of these principles, Okay, now these terms autosomal I've not used <coughs> until now, but I think your book has. An autosomal trait is any non-sex non linked trait, anything that's not X or Y linked. Okay? So anything that's linked to any of those other human chromosomes, any of the other 22 chromosomes is autosomal. Um, some basic characteristics of autosomal dominance. Big uh, guideline is that the trait appears every generation. You don't expect that of recessive traits. So if you're looking at a pedigree and you see individuals that are affected in every single generation, the first thing that should pop into your head is autosomal dominant, okay? or at least dominant. Sometimes X-linked dominance will show up in every generation as well. But you can tell those apart. 
Right? The trait on average is transmitted from an affected person to half their offspring. Right? So on average, half the offspring will show the trait. Um, overall, in this pedigree, we sort of see that. Um, here's these two individuals have produced what, one, two, three, four, five, six offspring, three of which show the trait. So there's an indicator that it may be an autosomal dominant. Um, down here, they sort of beat the odds. They got five offspring, three of which show the trait and two don't. But then here's a family where only one shows it and two don't. So if you take these together, once again, half the offspring show the trait and half do not. So on average, that's typical. If a person is unaffected, they don't transmit the trait. Here's a line of this family where this individual is unaffected. The trait does not appear in their offspring. Okay? Occurrence and transmission is not influenced by sex. Males are just as likely to get it as females. Uh, if we count how many males and females have this trait in this pedigree, we've got four males that show it. We've got four females that show it. There's no preference in terms of which sex shows the trait. All right, so if you see those characteristics, then you can immediately deduce that it is an autosomal dominant trait that you're looking at. All right, so every generation, um, half the offspring, unaffected, don't transmit, and un not influenced by sex. If you look at an autosomal recessive, though, it's quite a bit different. I mean, you compare these two pedigrees and you see that there's quite a bit of difference between them. Um, the trait usually only appears in siblings, not parents, not relatives, other relatives. Okay? One fourth of the siblings are affected. Classical autosomal recessive. I mean, that's like those mono, monohybrid crosses. You did a monohybrid cross, you expected one fourth of the offspring to show the recessive trait. It's the same thing in these pedigrees. On average, one fourth of the offspring should show the trait. Um, the parents of the affected may be consanguineous. That means um, genetic relatives, right? Consanguineous means genetic relatives. Those are typically indicated by a double line. That's why I've put another line up here. So usually you'd see a double line in a pedigree which indicates genetic relatives mating. Okay, males and females are equally likely to be affected, although that doesn't really show up in this, this uh, pedigree. Um, so we have, what, three generations in which the trait never appears. We get a consanguineous mating between first cousins and blam them, the trait shows up. All right, so that's classic for a an autosomal recessive trait. All right, so um, if you're looking at a pedigree and you see that every generation is affected, the first thing that should pop in your head is dominant. If you see a pedigree and you see several generations that don't show the trait, you should immediately think recessive. Right, now, determining whether it's autosomal or sex-linked takes a little bit more um, skull work, but it's not that difficult. Yes? Okay, so what if you have two first cousins that meet up and half of their kids have a disease and the other half don't? What's the odds of them producing children that will have? Um, well, first you have to determine, the, the question is fairly complicated. If, if you have first cousins that meet up, they don't show the trait, they reproduce, half their offspring show that trait. What's the probability that those individuals are going to produce affected offspring? Um, you first have to determine what kind of trait it is, whether it's dominant or recessive. If you see several generations where it doesn't show up, and then these two first cousins reproduce and produce half their offspring that show the trait, I'd say it's recessive and they beat the odds. Okay? Um, so that means that the in those re affected individuals, if they just reproduced with someone in the general population, very likely that all of their offspring will be normal but heterozygous. Right? Because we sort of assume that these traits are fairly rare in the population. The unaffected individuals, you don't know because they could be heterozygous or homozygous dominant. So it's a little bit trickier there. 
um, to figure out the probability. All right, so autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive are fairly clear cut. Um, telling the difference between those and the X-linked recessives and dominants is a little bit trickier. Okay, so let's look at an X-linked recessive. Right, this is just like uh, the hemophilia trait that we looked at a little bit earlier. <clears throat> Look at all the males that are affected. Now, you see individuals affected every generation. So you might be thinking dominant. That's fine. Your second instinct should be that you look at this pedigree and you see that only males are affected. All right, and that should tell you, oh, this might be an X-linked recessive because males are far more likely to be affected than females. There's also a classic pattern of inheritance in an X-linked recessive trait. <coughs> and it's being described here. An affected man through his daughter to half her sons. Okay? It doesn't really show here. But here we clearly have a carrier female because she's produced sons that show the trait. She also produced another carrier female here, okay, a daughter, who um, transmitted it to her sons. Right, the trait is never transmitted from male to male. Never. Okay, so if you'd seen something like this with an affected male producing affected sons, you'd know immediately this cannot be X-linked because males do not transmit X's normally to their sons. They transmit Y's. Right? To be a male, you have to have a Y chromosome. Where do you get it? From your father. Your X came from your mother. But the trait can be transmitted through carrier females. That's what's happening here. Carrier female, carrier female, okay? And it's likely that this female is a carrier, although she doesn't have to be. It's 50-50 shot. <clears throat> this female we know is a carrier. Why? Because she inherits that affected X from her father. It's the only thing she can inherit from him. She didn't inherit the Y because then she'd be male. All right, so she is a carrier. All right, so you see a pedigree like this where you've got lots of males affected and, and virtually no females. And the first thing that goes through your head is X-linked recessive. X-linked dominants are a little bit different, but not much. Okay? Um, this is the critical thing right here. Affected males have no normal daughters and no affected sons with an X-linked dominant. Look at this first part of this, these first two generations in this pedigree. Here, here's an affected male who produces four offspring, two sons, two daughters. Both daughters are affected. Okay, no normal daughters, no affected sons. Hey, notice also that females are more likely to carry or to show the trait than are males. Twice as likely in the general population. Right, if you look at all of the progeny. You know. <clears throat> if a female is homozygous, she transmitted to all of her offspring. Nobody escapes. Everybody gets it. Okay, so it's fairly easy to distinguish in these family trees or pedigrees the X-linked situation from the autosomal situation and the dominant from the recessive. 
by looking at who's affected, what sex is affected, and how often they're affected. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay, notice, however, <clears throat> this is an important point. An actually dominant can't be distinguished from an autosomal dominant by looking at female offspring. Because in both cases, you expect half the progeny to be affected. You have to look at the progeny of affected males. <clears throat> because there, none of the daughters escape, all the sons escape. Okay? So if you, if what that means is, for example, here, you're looking at just this female who's affected, normal male. They produce four offspring, two of which show the trait, two of which don't. Could be autosomal dominant. You have no idea if it's autosomal or X-linked. Okay? No idea. The clincher here is up at the top where that affected male produces no unaffected daughters. They're all affected. Right? So that's a critical point to look at when you're trying to figure out what kind of inheritance a pedigree is showing. So what I want to do is um, give you some example pedigrees and we'll see if we can figure out um, whether the traits are dominant or recessive and whether they're X-linked or autosomal. Okay, here's the first one. Nice big pedigree, five generations, lots of offspring. Geneticists love these kinds of pedigrees. <clears throat> I want to know how she survived this. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's actually way more common than it should be. I, uh, I'm a real proponent of zero population growth. I think the major problem that we as humans face is overpopulation. And I get, I get annoyed at people who have three, three kids. I get really annoyed at people who have four or more. And you know, I get livid when I see this many kids. There's no reason for that. There's no logical reason for that. Um, OK, so be that as it may, that's, that's my opinionated spewing for the day. Um, but I really think we can trace a lot of our problems to the fact that we, there's just too damn many of us. We need to stop. <laughs> there are. I mean, come on, six billion humans? And we're expected to double that by 2020? 12 billion humans? Where are all the, the resources going to come from? Where's all the food going to come from? I mean, we have got to stop reproducing that much. Two kids, that's enough. Replacement reproduction, that's all you need. OK, so um, looking at this pedigree, what we want to do is we want to try and figure out what kind of inheritance pattern is present and what kind of um, dominant or recessive relationships are here.
First of all, you can rule out dominant, right? <laughs> Pretty easily because it doesn't show up every generation. So now you're left with trying to figure out whether it's X-linked or autosomal. It can't be X-linked. It cannot be X-linked. <clears throat> Here's why. <clears throat> if it's X-linked, she's a carrier, okay, or potentially he has it. Okay, either way, um, well, actually, since if it's X-linked, since she shows the trait, he would have to have it and she would have to be carrier. Right? All right, well, given that, it means that this individual would have had to have cared, had it, right? He would have had to have had an infected X, which would have been transmitted to this daughter, who's a carrier, would transmit to this daughter, who's a carrier, that would then transmit to this son. All right? The problem is this individual is unaffected. All right? This individual would have to be affected if this was X-linked recessive. Would have to be. Same, same thing over here. This individual would have to be affected because it's got to come down through carrier females. These two could be carriers, but then he would have to be affected. So for that reason, this cannot be X-linked. So the only thing you're left with is um, it must be an autosomal recessive trait. Okay, let's look at this one. I'll move that up a little. Just concentrate on this one. Again, you can rule out dominant, right? Got to be recessive. The reason is that dominants don't skip generations, right? You've got to skip generation here. If this were a dominant, it'd show up every generation. So you know that's not the case. But is it X-linked or autosomal? The first clue in there is, is the fact that you've only got males affected. Now, that could be a fluke. But the little warning siren ought to be going off in your head right now saying, X-linked, 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 okay? <clears throat> if that's the case, then this male who's affected transmits to daughters who are carriers. They're heterozygous. They don't show the trait, but they carry the trait, right? So she's a carrier. She transmitted it to approximately half her sons. Oh, that fits. She also transmitted it to her daughter who is a carrier, and she transmitted it to her son. So this is consistent with X-linked recessive. It is not consistent with autosomal recessive because there's too many individuals affected. And you'd also expect some females to be affected if it was autosomal and they aren't. All right, so two things in this pedigree. Um, all males are affected, which says X-linked, and a skipped generation, which says not dominant. So you know what it is. Okay, well, let's look at another one. Okay, how about this one? Right here.
Dominant or recessive? Dominant. Dominant. Absolutely. Can you rule out X-linked versus autosomal? Yes. yes, you can because of this right here. This affected male should transmit the trait to all of his daughters and none of his sons, but only one of his daughters is affected. Therefore, it cannot be X-linked. It's as simple as that. This must be an autosomal dominant. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, we'll go through some of these next time as well, but I want to let you know that there are, in fact, some traits that are Y-linked. We don't know very many of them, but Y-linkage you could easily spot because every single male of an affected father is affected themselves. You see straight male inheritance every single generation. There's a trait called hairy ears, which is Y-linked, apparently. Um, there's a couple of other funny traits that are Y-linked. One of the main things that we know of that's Y-linked is the testes determining factor. Right? That's the gene that determines maleness. If you have that gene, you become a male. Okay, so we call that the male gene. There may be some other traits on the Y chromosome. We're not so sure about these, but um, there's a possibility. in almost every single one of these, <laughs> except, except for this one. This one I seem to have an overexpression of. I don't know why. <laughs> Selective hearing loss. <laughs> I hear what I want to hear sometimes. <laughs> okay, um, we'll stop there and we'll uh, resume this on Wednesday.